guys, my name is Mary. I would like to explain the purpose of this project. Um, it's, the big concept behind it is to be learning objective videos for lab. You will learn that going through lab is quite independent, so this will assist you in learning and identifying things in your list. Um, as we go along, you will meet my partners, Nick, Salvatore, and Patrick, and um, we all go through different labs to help you understand it. Be aware that functions are not a part of our videos, so I highly encourage that you make a table with the muscles that you, that you identify and their insertions and origins to help you understand their function. Additionally, making your own videos will help you as well because every cat looks different and um, this is a good way to review, not necessarily to uh, introduce any of these uh, anatomies. So I hope it helps you and if you find any mistakes or anything that you can do better, please go ahead and do so. This video, we're going over the skull and the spine. Starting with the skull, going from the rostral and the nose to the caudal end. We have the nasal bones, the frontal bones, the parietal bone, and the occipital bone. The parietal and the occipital are on both sides, but we have half a skull. There's also the temporal bone. And the temporal bone helps to make up the zygomatic arch, which is made up of the temporal bone here, the zygomatic, and part of the maxillary. This is all maxillary, and this is premaxilla. You can see that better if we flip it over. We have the premaxilla, the maxillary, and the palatine, and these three bones comprise the hard palate. Then if we come back over, and look inside, you can see the cribriform plate, and that, extending rostrally from that, are the nasal conche, or the turbinates, which means scrolls, and they help with respiration. So then we're going to switch scrolls, and move over here so that we can see some of the finer details. Here and here are the tympanic bulla, they house the middle ear, and they're ruptured in this, they're usually completely closed. This is the magnum foramen where your spinal cord is going to enter. It means big hole, so that's the best way to remember it. These are the occipital condyles. Occipital, because they're near the occipital bone, and condyles because they're round, barrel-like, and smooth. This little hole right here is the external auditory medius. It's your ear hole. Three words for something really simple. So now that we've gone through the bones, there are two canals and one marker to know. Inside of the orbit, there's a tiny bone called the lacrimal. And with the lacrimal, there's a canal associated with it. It is the nasolacrimal canal because it runs from the nasal cavity to the lacrimal. There's also the infraorbital canal. Infraorbital means below the eye, so it's always going to be somewhere around here. Depending on the species, depending on their age, it's going to shift a little bit. So infraorbital, below the eye. Nasal lacrimal, nose lacrimal. Then if we want to do teeth, your incisors would be here, then your premolars and your molars. They always follow that pattern, it just changes how many they have of each and whether or not they have them. So, we move on to the mandible. The mandible is actually comprised of two bones. Each individual bone is a dentary bone. This is the body of the mandible, and extending rostrally is the ramus of the mandible. And on the ramus is the metal foramen. There's one on each side. And on the inside, the medial aspect, is the mandibular foramen. The best way to remember this is that mental dental, the mental is by your teeth, and the mandibular is on the body of the mandible. These two processes up here are the coronoid process and the condyloid process. You can always remember what a, condo a coronoid is because it's the highest. Coronoid means crown. Condyloid comes from condyle, so it's going to be smooth, round, and barrel. Together, these comprise the temporal mandibular joint which is where your mandible attaches to the skull. 
One last thing is that where the two dentary bones meet, which would be right here, it's called the intermandibular synthesis, in between the mandibles. Now we're going to start with the vertebra, and later we're going to move on to the spine. There are five types of vertebra, or spinal bones. There are the cervical, which are your neck bones, the thoracic, which your ribs shoot off of, the lumbar, which is your lower back, the sacral, which in humans we call it our tailbone, and then the coccygeals, which aren't here, which are actually the bones of the tail. So we'll start with the cervical. This here, this large center, and this both comprise the body with the centrum. This is the spinous process, extending dorsally. So, in humans it would lay like this, in animals it would lay upright, so this is their back. This is the vertebral canal, and the roof is called the lamina. So just the roof, in surgeries they'll cut it off and replace it. These are the articular facets where the other vertebrae will articulate to. Then these two holes on the side are the transverse frame. Here, the little wings are the transverse processes. For the cervical, it's important to remember that it has... For the cervical, it's important to remember that the spinous process and the transverse processes are relatively proportional. They're going to be roughly the same size. Then we move on to the thoracic. You can tell immediately that it has very small transverse processes and a very high spinous process. And again, vertebral canal. And the lumbar has a very short spinous process and very long wings. And again, the canal's wider, body or central. Yeah. Last one is the sacral, which is comprised of the sacral bones that are fused together. So this is more than one more than one bone, but they've just fused together. Um, in cats and more flexible animals, they're less fused. In things like horses, they're a lot more fused. The back's a lot more rigid. Okay, so here we have a fully articulated skeleton of a goat. And we're going to be focusing on the spine and the ribs. As we talked about earlier, the spine is composed of the cervical, which is always seven cervical. Then the thoracic, which vary based on species depending on how many ribs they have. The lumbar, which have a general range, but they're always short spinous, long transverse. The sacral, which depend the amount of sacral bones is based on how flexible the species is. And the coccygeal, which are tail bones, and those vary widely between species. So if we go back up to the skull, you can actually see the hyoid apparatus in the skeleton, which is responsible for helping you to swallow. Then the important thing about the cervical bones is that C1 and C2, which is how they're named, that they allow you to nod and shake your head. So the atlas, which is C1, is butterfly shaped, it has these large wings, and it allows you to nod. Directly caudal to that is the axis, which allows you to shake your head no. The identifying characteristics of the axis is that it has the dens which is a tiny process that allows the atlas and the axis to kind of click together. So then if we move caudally to the ribs, we have your true ribs, your false ribs, and your floating ribs. The true ribs connect essentially directly to the sternum. The false ribs connect through long costal cartilages. So you can see here, it's very far away. The sternum's all the way over here and then the floating ribs, which are only attached to the spine and nothing else. Now the sternum is actually made up of three pieces. There's the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. The best way to remember that is that the manubrium is a tiny square on top, the body is a long rectangle, and the xiphoid process is a little triangle. Then, important things about the ribs is that they actually have identifying characteristics. So you can see, here is the head, here's the tubercle, 
then this little change is the angle, and then there's the shaft. So, if, to clarify, we have the head, and if there's a head, there's almost always a neck. The tubercle, which is where it would connect like these two parts. The angle, which is where <laughs> the rib starts to curve. The shaft, which is essentially the body, and then ends at the sternal end, where most will articulate through costal cartilages to the sternum. In this video, we'll be learning about the thoracic limb, which is also called the four-limbed animals, and the arms in humans. It is made of the scapula, the humerus, the radius and the ulnar, the carpals, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. Let's start with the scapula. You can tell the borders of the scapula by looking at the way the spine curves. The spine always curves towards the caudal aspect. This is the caudal border, the cranial border, the dorsal border. On the spine, you have the glenoid fossa, the supraglenoid tubercle, and the coracoid process. The coracoid process is almost always larger than the supraglenoid tubercle. You have the scapular spine, which would make up this entire part, the tuberosity of the spine, which is the rough part and is only present in some species, the supraspinous fossa, the inner spinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, sorry, and the subscapular fossa. In some species, you should be aware of the presence of a metachromion and a chromion. This is a chromion, which is very slightly visible. Shooting out as a T from the other end would be the metachromion. <laughs> now we move on to the humerus. The humerus very clearly has a head, and from the head you can tell the lateral and the medial ends. The lateral always tells you where the greater tuberosity is, and that way you can tell where the lesser tuberosity is. In between the two tuberosities, you have the intertubercular groove, or the bicipital groove. On the other end of the humerus, you have the olecranon fossa, the lateral and medial epicondyles, and the condyle, which in smaller animals is very obviously the trochlea and the capitulum, but in large animals is just called the condyle. Also, you have the, ver the not very obvious or visible deltoid tuberosity. We now move on to the radius and ulna, which with the humerus make up the elbow joint, which is a hinge. This is the radius, the head of the radius, the neck of the radius, the styloid process, which looks like something you could write with. Moving on to the ulna, the styloid process once more in the ulna, which is something that looks like you, like you could write with. This is the olecranon process, which attaches or meets at the olecranon fossa of the humerus. <laughs> this is the ulna, which is comprised of the olecranon process, which meets with the humerus something like this. The ulna also has the trochlear or semilunar notch, the coronoid process, which once again is the highest point or the crown, and the radial notch. The radial notch is where the radius articulates with the ulna. This is only seen in some animals that have the ability to pronate or supinate. Also seen in only a few animals that can pronate and supinate are a radius and ulna that are not fused. In animals where they are fused, they do not comprise a radial notch. However, they have a radial tuberosity. And once again, as part of the ulna is the styloid process, which looks like an instrument that you could write with. <laughs> we now move on to the carpus and the manus, the carpus being the wrist in humans and the manus being the, the hand. We have carpal, carpals, metacarpals, and P1, P2, P3 of the phalanges. These three bones are always named proximally to distally. There are always only two rows of carpals. They may vary in number between species, and there also exists a sesamoid bone in some species, but only two rows ever. They are divided by joints. You have the radiocarpal joint, the intercarpal joint, and the carpal metacarpal joint. 
We should also be aware of species called ungulates, which are horses, cows, and deer, and others, that walk on only their P3, their third phalange. There are species known as digitigrades, like the dog, the cat, or the pig, that walk on all of their phalanges. And finally, species like the human, groundhog, and rabbit, that are called plantigrade species, that walk on their phalanges and their metacarpals. This is the hind limb that we're going over. This is the pelvis. It's joined together by two anominate bones. The first and the second. Joined together by the pubic symphysis. This is the ilium. This is the body of the ilium. This is the crest of the ilium. This, these are the wings of the ilium. And then you have the sacral tubers and the coxal tubers. You can see that the sacral tubers are quite close to each other, while the coxal tubers are quite far away. This is where the sacrum of the spine is going to be moving. This, as we mentioned before, this is the pubis, joined together by the pubic synthesis. This is the body of the pubis. This is the ischium, so there are three parts of the pelvis, the ilium, the pubis, and finally the ischium. This is the body of the ischium, and these are the ischial tubers. This is the acetabulum, this is the socket of the ball and socket joint that the femur will be joining into, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And this is the obturator foramen. This is the femur. This is the medial aspect of the femur, and this is the lateral aspect of the femur. This is the head of the femur, and here, you can hardly see it, but this is the fovea capitis. It's an indent. You can see it a lot better in most femurs. Now, this is the neck of the femur. It's right next to the head. Now, instead of tuberosities, there are trochanters on the femur, as opposed to the humerus, which has tuberosities. So this is the medial aspect. So this is the lesser trochanter, and this is the greater trochanter. And in the middle of those trochanters is the trochanteric fossa, right in here. And on the distal end, there are condyles and epicondyles. So this is the medial aspect, since that's the side with the head. This is the medial condyle, and this is the lateral condyle. And in between them, there is the intercondyloid fossa. And on the sides of the condyles are the epicondyles. So this is the lateral epicondyle, and this is the medial epicondyle. And on the other side, the front end of the femur, there is the patellar surface, which is where the patella, or the kneecap, will sit. And the next bone we're going to look at is the tibia, as well as the fibula, but we're going to get to that when we look at the dog skeleton. So this is our tibia. This is the front of the tibia. You can see this is the tibial spine and the tibial crest, right here, or the tibial, tu uh, the tibial tuberosity. And this is the tibial spine, right? Yeah, this is the tibial crest. Right? Oops. <laughs> So this is the tibia, this is where the fibula would be, so this is the lateral side, and this is the medial side. So this is the tibial spine, the tibial tuberosity, and the tibial crest, right here. So there's also the condyles, this is the lateral condyle, so this is the lateral side with the fibula, and this is the medial condyle, and the back. This is the lateral tuberosity, right here, and the medial tuberosity. And also, there's the malleolus. This is the medial malleolus. malleolus. There are two malleoli, and one of them is located on the tibia, and the other one is located on the fibula, which we're going to look at right now. The malleolus is also known as the ankle bone.
So, this is a dog skeleton. This is our tibia. And this is our fibula, this very thin bone right here. This is the head of the fibula. This is the body of the fibula. And this is the lateral malleolus right here. So lateral, medial malleolus. So this is the distal end of the tibia. This is the talus, as you can see. This is the trochlea of the talus. It looks just like the patella. It's a trochlea. And this is where the tibia and the talus articulate. So this is the tarsal joint. You can also see in the back, this is the calcaneus. This is the tuberosity of the calcaneus. You can also see over here, these are all the different joints. So this is the tibiotarsal joint. This is the tarso, the intertarsal joint, right here, intertarsal joint. And this is the tarso-metatarsal joint because this is the, tar the uh, metatarsals right here. And then you have the phalanges right here, P1, P2, and P3, where the nail is going to grow out of. Hi, this is the first of our muscle lab video dissections, and we will start with the muscles of the head and the neck. First we have, very visible, the muscle masseter, and on the back of the head we have the temporalis. Moving cranially to caudally, we will start with the digastricus, which runs in a V-shape, and then we have the myelohyoid, which runs exactly as my pointer shows. And further down is the sternohyoid. The sternohyoid attaches on either side to the sternothyroid, which is slightly severed but still visible. And next we have the sternomastoids, which are slightly bigger but also severed. We also have the clidomastoids, which when you extend your clavicle, you can see attaches to the mandibular, to the masseter region. We have the very visible and evident jugular external, jugular vein, it's blue, and slightly deep, the carotid artery, which is pink. And even more deep to that is the vagus nerve, right there. We also have our salivary glands. This would be the mandibular salivary gland and the parotid salivary gland. Most cats also have lymph nodes, which are not as visible here, and a salivary duct, which we also cannot see. These are the muscles of the chest and the trunk. The first is pecto antibrachialis. The second is pec major then pec minor. You can see that pec major is actually smaller than pec minor. And finally, we have the xiphi humoralis. Begins with an X. Next we have the rectus abdominis, the straight muscle of the abdomen. Next we have the obliques, the external oblique. Then lift up another layer. This is the internal oblique. And then finally, we have the transverse abdominis, rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis. Right over here, we have the serratus ventralis, and then we also have the serratus dorsalis, right here. You can also see a very good example right over here. Then we have the intercostals. You can see this is the external intercostal. It's involved with inhaling, and this is the internal intercostal. It's involved with exhaling. So external inhaling, internal Exhale. That's it. Oh. Then we also have, finally, the scalenus. Hey guys, this is the video for the dissection of the muscles of the back and the shoulder. We first start by dissecting the cat along its abdomen and reflecting back its skin. We have the long latissimus dorsi, the longissimus dorsi, which runs all the way from the rump to the forelimb the spinal trapezius, which is shaped like a trapezium, the spinalis dorsi, and if you reflect back the muscles of the serratus dorsalis, we have the iliocostalis. These are very slightly visible, but they are tendons that attach to the ribs. Next we have the rhomboidus capitis and the rhomboidus muscle. 
This entire muscle is called the splenius. We also have the acromiotrapezius, attached to the acromion of the spine. If you reflect that back, you have the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, here, this is where the spine would be, and underneath, lying all the way underneath, is the subscapularis. This is the teres major. It moves freely from the rest of the forearm, forelimb. We have the spinal deltoid, runs from the spine to the deltoid. The acromiodeltoid, which runs from the acromion to the rest of the deltoid. And finally, the clido clavodeltoid, which turns into the clavomastoid. Trapezius, clavotrapezius, I'm sorry. This is the anatomy of the brain. First thing you're going to see is the innermost membrane of the meninges called the pia mater. Next you're going to see the giri, which are these ridges, and the indents between them, the sulci, or the sulci. Here we have the cerebrum. Next we have the cerebellum. Next you'll see this is the pons, and then we have the medulla oblongata which turns into the brainstem, and finally the spinal cord. You can also see the olfactory bulb right here, as well as the optic chiasma, which forms an X. You can see one half of it right here. You can also see in the arbor vitae, inside the cerebellum, you can see the gray matter, the darker portion, and the white matter, the lighter portion inside of the arbor vitae once again. This entire structure is the corpus callosum. Inside of it is the lateral ventricle, and inside of the lateral ventricle is the corp is the uh, sorry about that, the choroid plexus. Here is the third ventricle, and finally the fourth ventricle. This is the anatomy of the spinal cord. First thing we're going to look at is the gray matter of the spinal cord in here, and this is the white matter of the spinal cord. So first we got to determine if we have the dorsal and the ventral aspects. So this is dorsal because you can see the spinous process of the vertebrae, and this is ventral. So you're going to see the dorsal horn and the ventral horn. Then we have the dorsal nerve root these tendrils right here, and the ventral nerve root. Mm -hmm. Then we have the dorsal nerve root ganglion, or the dorsal nerve ganglion, sorry about that. And finally, we have the spinal nerve, where both the dorsal and ventral roots meet. This is the anatomy of the eye. First thing you're going to see is the conjunctiva, in this space all around this uh, structure called the cornea, part of the fibrous tunic. Also going to be able to see the space between the conjunctiva and the cornea is the limbus, this little border. On the other side, let's take another eye to look at this. This is the iris. The space in the middle is the pupil. On the outside is the ciliary body. Let's take a look at the optic nerve. You can see it from the outside. Hmm. Oop. Let's try another one. This is the optic nerve right here. Now the other side is the optic disc. This is the origin point of all the nerves inside of the retina. Let's talk a little bit about the anterior chamber. Ah, uh, here we are. Here's one with the lens. You can lift up that lens. You can see this chamber inside. This is the anterior chamber. It's filled with aqueous humor. You can also get a good look at the suspensory ligaments, or the remnants of them, on this structure called the lens. 
so this is where the suspensory ligaments would attach to the lens. On the other side of the lens is the posterior chamber filled with vitreous humor. Now let's talk a little bit more about that retina that we mentioned. This is the retina. It's part of the nervous tunic. This is the tapetum lucidum. And under that, this is the choroid, this black area. It's part of the vascular tunic. And this white part is the sclera, and it's part of the fibrous tunic. These are the extrinsic muscles of the eye. The first one you're going to see is the dorsal rectus. Next is the ventral rectus right here. The lateral rectus. And finally, you can't see it, but there would be a medial rectus right here. Next is the in superior oblique. Also another one you can't see right now, but there would be an inferior oblique right here. And finally, this is where the retractor bulb eye would be, where my hands are forming a bulb shape. It's a bulb that retracts the eye. These are the muscles of the portal. We'll start with the antebrachium here. On the medial aspect is the biceps brachii. And then immediately lateral to that is the brachialis. Here we have the three heads of the triceps. There's the lateral head, the long head, and deep to both of them is the medial head. Here in the elbow, there's a little triangle of muscle called the anconius. And then on the opposite, the medial aspect, we have the epitrochlearis here, which we reflected back so that we could get at the brachial plexus, which runs from the elbow up into the armpit. And this is where all the nerves, arteries, and veins are housed. So now we'll move into the forearm. The forearm muscles can be remembered through the acronym BECL, B-E-C-L-E. -E. So first we have the brachioradialis, then the extensor carpi radialis, the common digital extensor, and the lateral digital extensor. The common digital extensor throws off all of these tendons here, and then the lateral just throws off some more to the lateral aspect. Then we have the extensor carpi ulnaris, so from the carpals to the ulna. ulna. Then we move to the flexors. So we have the flexor carpi ulnaris, the superficial digital flexor, and here, this little triangle, is the pronator teres. We also have the deep digital flexor, which has many heads and peaks out throughout the forearm, and in between the two digital extensors, we have the abductor pollicis longus here, then a small separation, and the supinator. All right, now we're going to work on the circulatory and respiratory systems. We're going to start with the larynx, this lump of cartilages and fat. In order to find out how it's oriented, you want to lift up all this fat and muscle, and you'll see the thyroid cartilage. The thyroid cartilage is your Adam's apple, so that's going to point to the ventral side. So ventral side, dorsal side. Again, first of our cartilages, the thyroid. Then we have the epiglottis here, which is going to get pulled back and cover the trachea to stop any foreign objects from getting in there. If you look down into the larynx, you can see the two arytenoid cartilages. They look like folds because they actually cover the vocal folds and help with phonation. Flipping onto the other side, we have the cricoid cartilage. It forms a nice big old C. So there are five cartilages of the larynx. Thyroid, cricoid, epiglottis, which is a cartilage, and then there are two arytenoids. So then, if we move on to our cat's dissected circulatory and respiratory system, we can go into the trachea. So you can see very nicely, it has all of the C-ring cartilages running down it. And if you dissect it open, you can line them out. Following the trachea down, we get to the branching of the primary bronchioles, which is where it splits into the left and right lungs. The primary bronchioles then branch into the secondary and tertiary. You can still see the secondary, but you can't see the tertiary with the human eye. Then we have the lobes of the lung. There are the anterior, medial, and posterior. Anterior, medial, and posterior of the right and left lungs. 
and then on the right lung, there's an accessory lobe. Only the right lung has an accessory lobe. So then, well, as far as placement is concerned, we have the heart located between the two lungs, and that is called the mediastinum. And then where the heart and lungs are all housed inside the cat is the pleural space. Then we can move on to the heart, which we have here. Originally, the heart is covered in fibrous pericardium, the pericardial sac here. If you cut the sac open and flip it over, we have the serous part of pericardium. Here's the parietal layer, and here's the visceral layer. So the parietal layer of the serous pericardium is found on the opposite side of the fibrous pericardium. And the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is also called the epic cardium. Branching off of the heart, we have all of the greater vessels. So we have our superior vena cava, or cranial vena cava, and your inferior vena cava, or your caudal vena cava. We also have the aorta, which you can see right here. Part of the ascending arch, there are two branches. There's the brachiocephalic arch, which has three branches off of it. So one, two, three, and the left subclavium, which only has one. It's important to be able to identify the difference between the two. So then in order to actually get into the heart, we're going to move on to a pig's heart. So the first trick that you need to know about hearts is how to tell which is the right and which is the left. So the best thing to do is to take the apex, which is the point, make it so that it's facing the right, which it is. Yeah definitely. Then you make a valentine heart. So right now, my right hand following this vessel is covering the right side of the heart, and my left hand is covering the left side. So keeping that in mind, this area right here must be the right atrium. We know that this trick worked because here are the caudal and cranial vena cava entering into the right atrium. This is the right oracle. The oracles are basically attics for the atriums. They just store more blood. If we actually want to look inside, you can start to see the right AV valve, which is in between the atrium and the ventricle, which is the space here. And then moving up, 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 you can see the pulmonary semilunar valve, which separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary artery. So take the pulmonary artery, move out to the lungs, you come back into the lungs through the pulmonary vein. The pulmonary vein contains oxygenated blood. And here the you can see right down into the left atrium and you can start to make out the left AV valve down there. Here is the left oracle. It's much bigger. It stores a lot more blood. And also, you can see the walls of the left ventricle are much more thick than of the right ventricle here. Here is the left AV valve. And you can just make out the tip of my probe here, which is running all the way curved around the heart to the aorta. So a lot of people think that all of the atriums and ventricles just run on top of each other. They actually kind of curve a little bit, so it's not perfectly straight, but the left ventricle runs to the aorta, and here off of the ascending aorta, we have our two branches again. It's important to know that the first branching off is the left subclavian, and the second is the brachiocephalic. Another important feature of the heart, specifically the valves, are the corda tendinae. They're the heart strings here. So this wide sheet is the valve, or part of the valve, and then the strings are the corda tendinae, and then where the strings meet is the papillary muscle. Hey guys, to make things a little easier, we're going to go over the circulatory system of the heart. This diagram is courtesy of Dr. Black and the undergraduate and graduate TAs of fall 2013. We first start with blood entering the heart through the cranial and caudal vena cavae. They enter into the right atrium and through the right atrium of the right AV valve into the right ventricle. Here, the blood is sent through the, the pulmonary semilunar valve into 
the pulmonary artery, and out to the lungs. When it ascends back from the lungs, it comes in through the pulmonary vein into the left atrium and through the left AV valve into the left ventricle. It is then sent through the aortic valve into the aortic arch. And here it branches into the left subclavian and the brachiocephalic trunks. Other things to note are the ventricle septum, which divide the heart into the left and right chambers, and papillary muscles, which attach to the cord of tendineae to pull on these valves. Additionally, we can go over the layers of the heart. So first we have the fibrous pericardium, and directly attached to the fibrous pericardium is the parietal of the serous pericardium. Then we have the visceral of the serous pericardium, which is also called the epicardium. Then finally we have the myocardium, which is the heart muscle itself, and on the inside of the myocardium is the endocardium. Hi, these are the muscles of the rump. First muscle is the biceps femoris. Next is the cauda femoralis, right here. Then this is the gluteus maximus, the gluteus medius, also the tensor fasciae latae, right here. This is the sartorius as well. Now we're going to lift up the leg to take a look at the quads as well. So that first is the vastus medius, then you can see the rectus femoris. You can get a better look right over here. First you're going to see the vastus lateralis, the rectus femoris again, and inside the, rect uh, the vastus intermedius. Sorry. Now we're going to start looking at these. See if we can find that piriformis. Piriformis is right here. It's usually much larger. It can span all the way across here. Then you can see here is the gluteus minimus, the sciatic nerve. So right here, lift that up. This is where the gemellus would be, known as the twins. So there's two of them right up here. And finally, the quadratus femoris, right over here. Hey guys, this is a video for the digestive system of the cat. First we have the parietal and visceral peritoneum. The parietal peritoneum runs along the thoracic cavity, and the visceral peritoneum is attached to the organs of the cat. This is the esophagus, and as the esophagus meets the diaphragm, it is called the esophageal hiatus. Next, this large structure is the liver, and somewhere in the middle of the liver, you find a little sac called the gallbladder. The gallbladder is where bile is stored. Bile that is made in the liver is stored in the gallbladder, which is what gives it its little green tinge. If you run along the gallbladder, you find a common bile duct. It's not very visible, but this is about where it would lie. Next, we have the stomach. This is the stomach. This is the greater curvature of the stomach, and this is the lesser curvature of the stomach. Attached to the lesser curvature is the lesser omentum, and attached to the greater curvature is the greater omentum. If you pull on the greater omentum, you will see that it is attached to the spleen. The spleen is a fairly large brownish organ. Next, from the esophagus to the stomach lies a cardiac sphincter. It's the most cranial part of the stomach and is hard to identify. And from the stomach to the small intestine lies a pyloric sphincter. Also, a part of the stomach which would lie right about here is called the fundus. The fundus is where gas accumulates in the stomach. Now for the small intestine, we first have the duodenum. The duodenum runs along with the pancreas, this little white structure inside the lining. And as the duodenum continues, where the pancreas stops, it becomes the jejunum. The jejunum is extremely vesselated, as you can see all these red vessels. And the center, or where the vessels attach, is called the GALT, gut-associated lymphatic tissue. This is all GALT. You can tell that the jejunum stops when the vessels stop, and that's when you run into the ilium. This is the ilium. 
Here is the cecum, where the ileum stops, and where the large intestine begins. This, all the way down, is the large intestine. Hey guys, today we'll go over the four chambers of the rumen and stomach. These comprise the rumen, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum. We first start with the esophagus. As the food is brought down from the mouth through the esophagus into the rumen, it is fermented and it goes into the reticulum. In the reticulum, it is further chewed and it, and it rises and it goes back to the mouth through the esophagus in the form of cud if it is not chewed enough to be rechewed and then sent back into the rumen. From the rumen, it is then sent directly to the omasum. And then from the omasum, where water is exchanged, either taken up or given, it goes into the abomasum, which is closer to the true stomach of the human. From the, from the abomasum, it goes into the small intestine. In terms of structure, the, the rumen com, uh, comprises of very several pili, or little fingers. The reticulum is made of honeycomb structures on the interior. The omasum is called books, or many or many folds, and the abomasum is a smooth structure much like the human stomach. In a newborn ruminant, it is different because they, com they have a stomach that involves an esophageal groove. The esophageal groove, which is right here, shunts the, food, shunts the milk that the calf consumes directly from the esophagus into the abomasum. This is to prevent it from fermenting so that it can be consumed without being spoiled and then into the small intestine. Hey guys, this is the renal and urinary system of the cat. We first have the kidney. There are usually two kidneys in each individual. And at the cranial aspect, usually, you would find the adrenal glands. One's right there. From the kidney, you also have the renal vein, which is blue, and the renal artery, which is not very visible in this kidney, but would be red in color. And Running from the, ur from the kidney to the bladder, which is right here, the urinary bladder, is a ureter. One runs from each kidney to the urinary bladder. And from the bladder to the outside of the body is a connecting duct called the urethra. It's not very visible here either because it would be far deeper than we can see. Now, to the kidney itself, we have the out outer lining or the renal capsule. This is the renal capsule. It is very thin, and if you open up the kidney, you can see its inner parts. So here's the cortex. It's the white structure that lines the outside of it, the medulla, slightly brown, and the pelvic region. As part of the pelvis, or where the pelvis and the medulla meet, you also have a renal crest. Finally, you can tell that the renal, or the vein of the uh, kidney and the artery of the kidney exit the kidney, exit and enter the kidney from the renal hilus or the hilus of the kidney. Hey guys, these are the muscles of the lower leg. First, let's start with the semitendinous muscle, the semimembranous muscle, the gracilis. Next, we have the adductor femoris, the adductor longus and the very severed, sorry about that, the pectineus. We also have the iliopsoas, which is made of two heads, and the femoral artery, and running deep to it, the femoral vein. These make up the lumbosacral plexus. Moving further down in the cat, we have, from the lateral side, the cranial tibial, right here, the long digital extensor, the peroneus, which is made up of three divisions, but you probably will not be tested on, the soleus, and the gastrocnemius. Along the medial side, visible once again is the gastrocnemius, but only visible on the medial side, the plantaris. You can also see the deep digital flexor. It's quite deep, so it's, it's hard to tell from this side, but it'll be right there. and the long digital flexor. And finally, where this red artery runs along, 
the cranial portion would be the popliteus. Is that for your love videos? This is the male reproductive tract and other organs. So this is a ram penis. First thing you're going to see is the sigmoid flexure. It's a sigmoid flexure because it's shaped as an S, S for sigmoid. Next thing you're going to see are the retractor peni muscles. These two things right here. This is the root of the penis. Also, this is the prepuce right here. You can also see the glands penis right here. And this is the urethral process. So we're going to move on to a ram testicle. First thing you're going to see is right here. Let's start with the epididymis. How about that? So, this is the head of the epididymis. It's where the uh, sperm are going to mature. We're going to follow where it goes to the tail. So let me open this up right here. So head is going to go down through here. To the, there we go. Sorry about that. So head all the way down through the body of the epididymis to the tail of the epididymis. Finally, it's going to go down the ductus deferens, also known as the vas deferens. It's going to carry the sperm out of the testicle. It's going to go into the spermatic cord, right here. We can also talk about the layers of the testicle. First thing you're going to see, this is the tunica vaginalis communis, as well as the tunica vaginalis propria. So this is the parietal uh, layer, and this is the visceral layer. And finally, let's talk about the inguinal canal. It's the opening in the abdominal muscles through which the spermatic cords pass into the abdominal cavity. Obviously, you can't see those, but you're going to need to know it anyway. So, signing off. Okay, this is the female reproductive system of the cat. So you can't really see the body of the uterus, but you can see where it separates into its two horns. This horn, if you follow it through, you will find the ovary that is encased in the infundibulum and the oviduct, this very thin layer. The oviduct is where the ovary gets sent, or the egg gets sent into the uterine horn where it will then develop. Okay, so to get a better look we at the female reproductive system, we have the reproductive system of a cow, of a female cow. This is a non-pregnant cow. So the easiest way to start would be to find the cervix and to follow the cervix up into the uterus, the uterine body, and its two horns. Here are the two horns. At the ends of the horns, you can find its eggs, or ovaries, I'm sorry. And a little easier to see on this side, this would be the ovary with its infundibulum and the oviduct, which is what the egg passes through into to get into the horn to develop into a fetus. This is a pregnant cow, and once again, if you find the cervix, cervix is usually very tight and only open during parturition and uh, estrus, find the cervix and follow it into the uterine horns. And here is the, this is a cotyledonary type placenta, so you can tell on the maternal side, these are the car uncles. An easy way to remember that would be mothers drive cars, the car uncles on the maternal side. And if you follow the placenta of the baby, the placenta has the cotyledons, which together make the placentome. Here is the fetus and the umbilical cord that connects it to the placenta, through which nutrients and gases are exchanged between the mother and the fetus, and waste products are removed from the fetus's body.